By texting 64,000, you agree to receive recurring automated marketing messages from Bartesian. Message and data rates may apply. No purchase required. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I would love to come home to a bartender who'd whip up any cocktail I ever wanted. A perfect old-fashioned, a margarita, a new cocktail I've never tried. Well, guess what? Now it's possible with the Bartesian Cocktail Maker. This thing is sleek, the size of a coffee maker, and it makes premium cocktails at the touch of a button. And it's not just the basic, ordinary cocktails. You can choose from over 50 different cocktails, from the classics to the exotic premium ones. Just touch a button, and you have freshly mixed, perfectly balanced cocktails in seconds. When my wife and I entertain, which sometimes is a little too often, the Bartesian cocktail maker is the center of the party. It's great because we don't have to stock all kinds of individual mixers for complicated recipes. Every guest gets a cocktail of their choice in literally seconds. We've even given the Bartesian as gifts to our family and friends. And now for a limited time, get free cocktails and free shipping with your new Bartesian. Just text PODCAST to 64000. Text P-O-D-C-A-S-T to 64000 to get free cocktails and free shipping. Text PODCAST to 64000. Welcome to Three Yards Per Caddy, a podcast covering the Miami Dolphins and the NFL. Now, here's your hosts, Chris, Alf, and Simon. And we're on, and welcome to another edition of Three Yards Per Carry, uh, maybe Vic Fangio edition of Three Yards Per Carry. I'm Alfredo Artiaga, Simon Clancy is here. Chris Kaufman is under the weather. We should have him later on this week, maybe. Kind of like he doesn't die. (laughs) Well, yeah, of course. If he dies, well, you know, the bad thing is that we're no longer three yards per carry, but we do get an increased share of OnlyFans, Simon. So that's kind of a good thing, right? How can people (laughs) get on OnlyFans? I mean, literally go to our Twitter at three yards per carry, and it's the pinned tweet, and you sign up, and it's three dollars a day. A week. I mean, it's three dollars a month, and it's the biggest bargain of all time, quite frankly. And if you're not on there, who even are you, quite frankly? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And if you were on there, you would have learned about this Vic Fangio hypothetical signing <laughs> way ahead of anybody else. It's getting weird here on a Monday, and we will talk about it on this show. But as always, this show is brought to you by Manscaped. Use promo code 5RSN and you get 20% off your entire order plus free shipping. They decided that 20% was just not enough. So now they're giving you free shipping as well. And of course, now they have beard products, Simon, which we will be talking about next month because that's the, nice. the the ad copy for next month. And of course, price picks. Use promo code 5 F I V E. And if you deposit $100, they give you $100. It's a one-time rollover, which is essentially, they're just giving you $100. So might as well take it. And, of course, Better Edge. Go to betteredge.com slash the number five reasons, and they give you $25 just for signing up. All right, we got Vic Fangio. Maybe. Maybe. (laughs) This is is kind of weird, right? Well, first of all, your reaction. uh, And then we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to assume he's in the fold, and then we're going to talk about other things. But your reaction to the news today. I think it's quite interesting because obviously the news broke yesterday. Tom Pelissaro tweeted that the Dolphins had agreed a deal that was then tweeted by a number of other NFL insiders saying that the deal was done. You had people like Cameron Wolf, Jeff Darlington, et cetera, et cetera, also saying it was done. Then as what tends to happen after national news is broken by an NFL network or an ESPN person, that the Dolphins uh, beat writers spoke to their sources at the Dolphins and you had a number of people um, whether that was Marcel, whether that was Dave Hyde, whether that was Barry Jackson, whether that was Daniel Ofusi, um, et cetera, it's Joe Shad, et cetera, et cetera, um, then tweeting out that they had confirmed with a source at the Dolphins that the deal was done. It wasn't signed, but the deal was done to make Vic Fangio the highest paid coordinator in NFL history, or certainly the most the highest paid coordinator currently in the NFL. Then last night, Mike Cleese, the Denver Broncos um beat reporter tweeted that he'd spoken to Vic Fangio and Fangio had said that actually no nothing had been finalized you, you know things weren't to which you know through a little bit of sort of cat amongst the pigeons we obviously get up this morning there's further confirmation so for example somebody tweeted Barry Jackson uh and Andy Slater earlier on saying um to, in fact Barry Jackson was talking about how um WQAM and the the Dolphins broadcast will go on to iHeart. And somebody tweeted saying, can you confirm Vic? And Barry replied, confirmed. But then in the last 45 minutes, Michael Silver, hugely reliable 
um, San Francisco Chronicle columnist, mm-hmm. um, former NFL Network guy, tweeted, for what it's worth, Vic Fangio told me late last night, nothing has been decided on my end. There is a huge amount of mutual respect between Carl Shanahan and Fangio, a highly su- successful Niners DC under Jim Harbaugh, and it appears the 49ers will have an opening soon. Now, in the last three minutes, somebody tweeted him, with, quote tweeted Barry Jackson's confirmed tweet saying, Miami reporters are saying it's confirmed, to which Silver has replied, well, tell them to take out with my source. Vic Fangio. Something may have changed since we last communicated, but what I tweeted was directly from him. Now, what I can say is that having spoken to a source uh, with the Dolphins who is in Mobile at the Senior Bowl, their understanding is that whilst it is not signed, that the deal for Vic Fangio has been agreed um, and there is no ambiguity around it. As far as they believe, he will become the new defensive coordinator of the Miami Dolphins. The concern for me will be that without the paperwork being done, I think there is a potential possibility with D'Amico Ryans looking to take in the next 24 to 40 hours the head coaching job at the Houston Texans. That will mean that a defensive coordinator position will open up at a team that Vic holds very close to his heart, which is the San Francisco 49ers with the number one defense in the league um, and edge rushers that absolutely fill what he wants to do, safeties that fill what he wants to do on the back end, led by Talano Hufanga, um, and a very strong secondary and also obviously an outstanding linebacker group. Now, my understanding is that Vic Fangio at age 64 believes that he could still be an NFL head coach. Whether that's realistic or not, we don't know, but... Mm. Frank Reich, at age 62, has just been hired as the Carolina Panthers head coach. So I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that if Fangio uh, goes to San Francisco and that defense continues and even gets better uh, and the 49ers go deep into the playoffs, as they almost certainly should do, given how loaded that that team is, there is a potential that this is the NFL. You know, these owners aren't always progressive. They might think, you know what, Vic Fangio can still get it done, still been a leader of men, has still completely led that defense, has still been a you know associate head coach in San Francisco. That's kind of where we are as of whatever time we're recording now, sort of just after, just coming up to, to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. in the UK. Um, and nobody really knows i mean the the person that knows is vic fangio but as far as the miami dolphins are concerned confirmed through nfl network sources confirmed through local miami media sources and through our own sourcing vic fangio is the defensive coordinator de facto defensive coordinator of the miami dolphins something might change it could be an incredible black eye for the dolphins if it does change (laughs) if fangio suddenly decides that he walks away and becomes the 49ers dc now the, the flip side to that is that if he does walk away there are still two extremely good candidates in Sean Desai and Chris Richard, who are on the docket to potentially take over. Now, obviously, these are moving parts. You know, Chris Richard could go and become the, the Saints defensive coordinator. Um, Sean Desai, a bit different because Clint Hurt is a defensive coordinator with the with the Seahawks. He's the associate head coach, but Desai might be the most likely. You don't particularly want to fall back to our own guy who we interviewed. Um, I mean, that really would be a step back from going from Vic Fangio to, you know, to that scenario. And I do think that the interview with Austin really was more about getting his name out there amongst the the league cognoscenti as it was for anything else. So, you know, I yeah, don't Anthony, really... Anthony Campanile. Yeah. Ant- sorry, Anthony Campanile. I don't know why I called him Austin. Um, uh, I don't think that that is anything more than a sort of not tokenistic because that's that's rude to a to an extremely good coach but you know i think that's getting his name out there and about so that in 12 months time you know when the cycle comes around again teams are thinking oh well anthony campanile had a had a had a defensive coordinator interview with the dolphins you know maybe we should take a look and he's done a good job there so so yes but everything is up in the air and yet everything seems nailed down so it's a (laughs) it's 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 a strange situation yeah it's a strange situation now i will say this uh, what Miami does have going for them, I think that the path to a head coaching job is better here than in San Francisco, and I'll tell you why. He takes over that that 49er defense. He's taken over the number one defense in the NFL. So how much better can he make it? <laughs> you understand? And a lot of people are always going to point to Kyle Shanahan as the main uh, beneficiary of you know whatever happens on that team. So if they win 14 games, they're going to say, you know, it's Kyle Shanahan's team that won 14 games because he's been good for a while. You know, he comes to Miami. He's taking over kind of an underperforming defense 
that's sneaky talented that he's probably looking at like, you know what, this defense is probably easily top 10 already. And yeah. I had a couple of pieces. I'm going to look like a hero over there with the with the young coach, Mike McDaniel. This team wins 12 games. I'm going to look like a genius. This is the top, top, top five defense. And God forbid we make an AFC championship game. I'm a head coach right away. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I suppose you've got to look at it a from Vic's point of view and b from that sort of lack of progressive, you know, ownership around the NFL who just think you know, oh, here's a guy that, whilst, you know, whilst D'Amico Ryan's is the the engineer of that defense, um, you know, there is a possibility that if he goes there, they continue their run. That that uh, you know. Those co- those uh, owners will just think you know fix next man up kind of thing. I, I think the X factor name in all this might be uh, Ishara Overo. Um, you know, if he doesn't get a head coaching job, certainly in Indianapolis where he had a second interview, um, he's not going to go back to Denver. Uh, he's a very young, very aggressive, progressive, young defensive coordinator, head coach waiting to to happen kind of thing. I think the flip side to him getting the job might be that Stephen Ross would think that it might just be a one year deal because he's probably going to get a head coaching gig fairly soon. Mm-hmm. That's obviously the, the the problem that you run with, with all of these guys. But I suspect that Ivero probably more likely to get a head coaching gig than either Desai or Chris Richard in the next 24 months. Mm. Yeah. And, and another thing I think that's in Miami's favor is the money. You know, uh, taxes in Florida, you know, it's just better <laughs> than in California. And nobody's going to beat Stephen Ross in a check writing contest. You know what I mean? Yeah, agree. And Vic Fangio at his age might be thinking, you know what? Maybe uh, a little bit larger nest egg is probably a good idea at this point. <laughs> yep. You know, so Miami has a lot going for them. Uh, and, you know, the main thing they have going for them is that every single report, besides a couple that are strangely coming from from Vic Fangio suggests that he's already the the de facto DC. Now I will say this: the original report by Tom Pelissero has one red flag, in my opinion. It says that he is, uh, yeah, he's the highest paid, yeah, for sure, uh, defensive coordinator. But it says three years plus a team option. That doesn't strike me like something that that Vic Fangio would want, right? That's too team fr- That's too Miami Dolphin friendly to have a team option for a fourth year. Yeah. Yeah. I, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like that's not like if I'm Vic Fangio, I'm I'm negotiating the most favorable deal possible for myself. Yeah. And I would have just asked for that three year deal with no, you know, no I'm designation. Good, I'm yeah. just a defensive coordinator. So that way I can leave whenever the hell I want for anybody. You know? If San Francisco becomes available next year, I'll go to San Francisco. You know, uh, that's what I would do if I was Vic Fangio. Who knows what they're – maybe they're negotiating the title right now to yeah, see if maybe. Miami had some kind of protection to hold them here so he can't make a lateral move. Maybe that's what they're doing. It's a possibility. You know? Yeah, definitely. But, but, but we don't know. All right, we're going to go to break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how this positively or negatively affects some players on this team because we're just going to assume – that Vic Fangio is going to be the defensive coordinator. Of course, now this podcast could look, we could look like total clowns in a couple of days, but let's just, let's just hope that we don't. All right. These words. Do you have a water leak and can't find where it's coming from? Are you dealing with water or mold damage in your home or business? Then call Water Cleanup of Florida at 954-579-0356 for immediate assistance. With over 60 years of combined experience, Michael, Robert, and their team is prepared to handle all types of leak detection issues. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. After the leak has been located and repaired, Water Cleanup of Florida will then clean, dry, and fully restore the damaged areas. Water Cleanup of Florida is fully licensed, insured, and certified to provide the one-stop shopping that busy homeowners and business owners require. There is no need to bring in other contractors. They will handle the entire project from start to finish. Service areas include Miami, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. Call Michael anytime on his personal cell phone at 954 579 That's 954 954- Five seven nine zero three five six, or visit their website at wcufl.com. Water cleanup of Florida. If you have the schmutz, 
They have the guts. By texting 64,000, you agree to receive recurring automated marketing messages from Bartesian. Message and data rates may apply. No purchase required. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I would love to come home to a bartender who would whip up any cocktail I ever wanted. A perfect old-fashioned, a margarita, a new cocktail I've never tried? Well, guess what? Now it's possible with the Bartesian Cocktail Maker. This thing is sleek, the size of a coffee maker, and it makes premium cocktails at the touch of a button. And it's not just the basic, ordinary cocktails. You can choose from over 50 different cocktails, from the classics to the exotic premium ones. Just touch a button and you have freshly mixed, perfectly balanced cocktails in seconds. When my wife and I entertain, which sometimes is a little too often, the Bartesian cocktail maker is the center of the party. It's great because we don't have to stock all kinds of individual mixers for complicated recipes. Every guest gets a cocktail of their choice in literally seconds. We've even given the Bartesian as gifts to our family and friends. And now for a limited time, get free cocktails and free shipping with your new Bartesian. Just text PODCAST to 64000. Text P-O-D-C-A-S-T to 64000 to get free cocktails and free shipping. Text PODCAST. Podcast to 64,000. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. Here at Fansided, using LinkedIn Jobs is one of the ways we find some of our best employees. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post, company, and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. Identify the most qualified candidates with LinkedIn Jobs and connect with them fast and for free. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all on one platform. And if you'd like to get your company to the next step in 2023 and achieve those important goals, finding the right team member might help you do that. And that's where LinkedIn Jobs comes in. LinkedIn Jobs is number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash arrowhead. That's linkedin.com slash arrowhead to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And we're back. All right, Simon. Like I said, you know, we're going to assume that we're not going to look like complete clowns in a couple of days. Okay. And Vic Fangio is going to be the defensive coordinator of this team. Who does this benefit the most? And I'm going to argue for one guy. And this is not me. This is not my brilliance coming out on this podcast. I'm actually stealing this from Kyle Krabs. <laughs> okay, of the Lockdown Dolphins podcast. Uh, he suggests that Tutanga Valoa could could be of great benefit to this because he's get he gets to go against that defense and practice every single day. And if you remember, that was the first defense that that completely solved Tutanga Valoa, and he did it by basically you know, sending five the entire game and playing a lot of cloud six under, which is essentially, cl- you know, cluttering the short zone. And, well, Tua gets to play if, you know, if Vic Fangio is the defensive coordinator, Tua gets to practice against that all year in OTAs, in camp, and during the season. That that has to be a great benefit to the quarterback. you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And also, look, I think it, what it does is it gets Tua back on the field quicker. You know, in terms of you, you don't want that defense. If that defense is going to play at a top 10, top five level, it means we're getting the ball back. It means we have the opportunity to score more. Um, you know, so that's also beneficial to it. But yeah, going you know, iron sharpens iron, going up against uh, that defense and especially going up against defenses that have kind of worked him out or coordinators that can kind of work him out, I think um, will only make him better. You know, and I think, yeah, he's going to, the, the more. The more teams look at what the 49ers did this year, what the Chargers did this year, um, the more that they will see that there are ways and means, even if you go back to early in the season with what Buffalo did and with what Baltimore did in terms of um, you know, some of the little nuances that they threw into the mix um, to try and, I mean, they didn't, but to try and nullify what the Dolphins were doing. So, um, yeah, I think going up against... A, a, a coordinator and a defense that understands your your weakness, as it were, um, in terms of where you put the ball and where you struggled most of all um, in actual games, will be hugely beneficial to do it. Yeah, but Javon Holland 
in reality. Like that's that's the guy. That's the guy that's that should yeah. be moving into all pro status under a, a Vic Fangio system. You agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at the you know you look at the role in terms of the safeties. Um, you know, and especially you know what what Vic tends to do is you know you'll have you'll have three down linemen, and I would I would expect that you know what you'll see is christian wilkins and zach sealer move to end you'll see raekwon davis you'll see john jenkins i wouldn't surprise me if they signed akeem hicks they'll probably bring in another guy who plays the nose tackle position a big veteran guy you know whether that's linval joseph or a sue or whoever um you obviously have the edge the outside guys which will be chubb which will be phillips which will be you know all of those guys that we've you've seen flying off the ball uh, around the end um and then the light boxes um and then huge changes in the secondary at the snap you know they tend to flood the secondary with with defensive backs um and then they move players around very late on or or at the snap or immediately after the snap to try and confuse the quarterback and um you know, you will see, uh, you know, you only have to look at the the Eagles game yesterday. You know, the system that Jonathan Gannon runs, very similar to the system that Vic Fangio runs. Uh, and you saw how many defensive backs there were making plays, whether that was Kayvon Wallace or Gardner Johnson or James Bradbury or Slay or Avante Maddox or, or Epps. Um, players all over the field making plays having roles you saw Chauncey Garner Johnson coming down into the box you saw him carrying receivers deep down the field and I think for Javon Holland he will be the the standout player in that in that secondary because of his his skill set and you'll see him do a, a myriad of different things some of which will go back to what he did so well at Oregon which is lining up and covering you know you look at what Chauncey Garner Johnson does for, for Philadelphia I would suspect that that Holland's role will be very similar and Gardner Johnson one of the best defensive backs in the league so I think you'll see a very similar uh, uh, a very similar scheme and you'll see it schemed up to take most advantage of Javon Holland's skill set on the back end yeah and another thing that I talked about is uh, he doesn't blitz too much uh, Vic Fangio doesn't blitz too much but when he does he like he likes that pressure five system which I kind of like too because it, it really takes advantage of your best athletes up front especially your edge players and a staple of a team that brings pressure with five is that two by one blitz, which is essentially to try to explain it. I explained it on only fans with a little diagram. It's really, really simple. You're essentially running two guys at a tackle. It's that does, that's all it is. <laughs> okay. And one guy's going to go inside. One guy's going to go outside and you're just trying to, you, you're essentially trying to make the, the tackle screw up and take the wrong guy. And if he takes the wrong guy, you have a free rusher. It's as simple as that. Uh, I've argued that, you know, Jerome Baker may be kind of in that Malik Reed role from a few years ago could, you know, could benefit this this system. You kind of disagree. And you think that there's something something else we have. And maybe Jerome Baker is not for long in this well, system. I just think that, you know, those those rushing outside players will be the rushing outside ends, you know, in terms of the, the those guys that we have you know, on our team and uh, whether that's re-signing Van Ginkel and um, whether that's re-signing uh, Melvin Ingram, but they are the guys that will essentially be rushing, uh, rushing the passer. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I wonder where a role uh, for Jerome Baker fits because he's not an archetypal Vic Fangio linebacker. Um, he just isn't. Uh, and, you know, if we're saying that Baker would rush outside at 10 million a year, I'd much rather have, have Andrew Van Ginkle, um, who is a, who is a much, um, a much better pass rusher than, um, than Baker is. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at a tweet from Tom Pelissaro to say that the salary cap's gone up a significant amount uh, this year. So there'll be more, more money, I think 16, 17 million extra. Nice. Um, for clubs yeah um, which is that's that nice. that's that uh amazon money from from yeah. thursday night football and then so, sunday sunday take it i believe is going to youtube so yeah. yeah but like you look at a guy like uh, um the guy who's a free agent of the texans uh, ogbonio um uh, i can't pronounce his second name okoronkwo um who's the kid out of oklahoma fifth round pick in 2018 uh, you know there's a guy that would would perfectly fit what the dolphins are trying to do in terms of sub package rushers you look again at philadelphia yesterday you know uh four their top four defensive ends all had 11 plus sacks last season hassan reddick obviously led the the team with 17 and a half but you throw in fletcher clocks bradley graham um yeah brandon graham even 
Um, I think 49 sacks from their top four guys and 69 sacks in total, which is a phenomenal number. And you think of, I think Jonathan Gannon plays 10 players on that defensive line in a rotation, all having at least 10 snaps minimum and nobody more than about 35 snaps. So just to keep everybody fresh and keep everybody, you know, I think that's what you'll see, um, you know, you'll see with the Dolphins. So I think what you might see in free agency, you know, you could imagine a, a guy like TJ Edwards coming in and playing linebacker for the Dolphins. But I mm. think what you'll find is some sub package pass rushers like Okoronkwo um, and Van Ginkle, um, you know, sticking around because that's what they do coming after the quarterback, which is what, which is what Fangio wants to do. The more that I think about it, it does make a ton of sense that that two by one combination is going to be Phillips with his hand in the ground and Chubb coming right behind him. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, it makes perfect find, sense. Yeah, and you'll find. I mean, uh, there were times where they lined up Von Miller and and Bradley Chubb from the same side and got them to rush. You know, I mean, good luck stopping that. You know, so mm-hmm. um, I, I think it's very intriguing to see what what will happen and and how they play it if if Fangio is the guy. You know, and we wait to we wait to hear definitively. You know, I see a tweet from Andy Slater saying that the deal is the deal is done. I, mean, I, I doesn't know, you know, where this is coming from in terms of in terms of other people. Well, I don't know how the, how reliable this is, but there's another guy on Twitter that has a picture of Vic Fangio at the Hard Rock Hotel, and he says it's from Sunday, which means that he was at the Hard Rock Hotel last night, and that's in Hollywood, Florida. So okay. so who knows, right? But who knows when that picture's from? Like, that picture yeah. could have been from November. Like, you know, who knows? So Andy you know? Slater's tweeted, the Vic Fangio will be the Dolphins defense coordinator. An official announcement from the team will come after he signs a piece of paper with a pen. <laughs> And it's possible that could happen today. So, <laughs> okay. So he hasn't signed. Well, uh, I'm pretty sure they have docu sign. Okay, because I think I've explained this on the show yes. before that uh, every time that you see a player or a coach like signing a piece of paper, they're signing a blank piece of paper. It's ceremonial. <laughs> There's nothing there. Like you know that they take that home and they save it, save it as a memento. The actual contract is done by docu sign. They send it to your phone and you're pressing a bunch of buttons that's yeah. saying you agree to a bunch of conditions. So maybe Vic, we, maybe Vic doesn't have a phone. You, you know what? I was He's thinking old. about that today. Maybe maybe they send him the docu sign, and Vic is like, "What in the hell is this thing that they're sending me?" No, I need a I need a, a contract, and I need a fountain pen, and I need a desk, right? Yeah, and, and, we, somebody, need to, and we need to do it on on the on the deck of the Missouri, the USS Missouri. Somebody has tweeted Michael Silver saying, "Fuck you and your <laughs> source." He's a dolphin. To which Silver has replied, "Dude." My source is Vic Fangio. <laughs> you know, that's a bit of a mic drop. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. All we need is uh, Vic Fangio to, to, to chime in on Twitter. Does he even know that Twitter exists? Uh, who knows? Right? Like, there's no way. Like, there's there's a possibility that Vic Fangio doesn't know that Twitter exists. Like, he doesn't know what Twitter is. He probably thinks, uh, you, know, you know, I got a My, MySpace account. He might think something like that. Michael Silver believes that Vic Fangio will be going to the 49ers. Apparently. Really? Yeah, I mean that's a that's in a sub tweet rather than anything that he's just um and and Cody Rourke who is a beat reporter uh for Locked on Broncos. So I suppose the kind of the equivalent of Carl Krabs has put yep yeah, Mike Silver take it for all it's worth believes Fangio may go to San Francisco. Huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, th- to be fair, Michael Silver is like kind of a San Francisco homer. He, yeah. You know, yeah, he, he's been covering the the Forty ers for about a thousand years. So but he that's... is um, he is well connected. Yes, yes, he is. You know, he's very he's like essentially Barry Jackson on the West Coast. <laughs> you know, it would be uh, a black eye for the Dolphins if they lost out from this position. You have got to say, yeah, because uh, you know they had the guy in the building. Uh, he's essentially agreed. It's too many people. It's there's no way this many people are wrong. So if he's agreed to be the defensive coordinator, it's kind of assumed like, okay, a guy, uh, a man tells you, yeah, I will, I'll work for you. I'll take this position. And then all of a sudden he's gallivanting about and talking to, to beat writers from the West Coast. You know, it sounds like he's trying to leverage one or the other. Who knows? Maybe he's trying mm-hmm. to get the 49ers to, to make an offer so then he could go back into Stephen Ross's pockets. Maybe but, he's yeah, trying for more cash. Yeah, that's a that's a distinct possibility. Continuing with with Big Fangio, what's missing on this team right now? Because yeah, they have some free agents 
that we kind of assume will be back. Like Alan Roberts is too cheap and too effective in a player, effective a player to just let walk. Guy makes three million dollars a year, you know. Yeah. So that's a guy you kind of expect back. I know for a fact they want Melvin Ingram back, but I'm pretty certain that if Vic Fangio is a defensive coordinator, he'll have the final say. But why wouldn't you want a guy like Melvin Ingram, a team leader? Should be cheap. Yeah. But what's missing on this team uh, to to play this style of defense? Like, what's missing from the defense? Defensive backs, obviously. Cornerbacks. I think you need another. I think you need at least one, maybe two linebackers. I think you need a nose tackle. Um, I think the safeties. I mean, Brandon Jones will be quite interesting because Vic doesn't blitz, and Brandon Jones is probably the best blitzing safety in the league, probably. Mm. Maybe even the best blitzing defensive back alongside um, the guy that plays for the Bengals, Mike Hilton. Um so it'll be interesting to see what happens to Brandon Jones um, because he's not necessarily a natural fit. You know, you look at someone like a Von Bell of the Bengals. Von Bell is mm. perfect um, for what the Dolphins are looking for in sort of that split safety. Jordan Poyer is another one. We talked about Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. You go back and look at Adrian Amos, who worked for a number of years uh, under Fangio in Chicago, now with Green Bay and is a free agent, but hasn't had a very good season. But again, another player that knows the scheme, knows the system well, but they definitely need defensive backs. Um, and I don't think that changes. They just, just the style of defensive back changes. So you look at the draft, you look at someone like a Clark Phillips out of Utah, now might be more utilized than a Devin Witherspoon, who you're not going to get to anyway, because he's going to go too high. But a Devin Witherspoon of Illinois, a Cam Smith of South Carolina, those man match man cover guys, that's not necessarily the, the Fangio. That's you know, much more zone coverage on the back end. So somebody like a Clark Phillips would be would be perfect for that. Now, not that they would do this, but let's say that Chris Greer opened up cap space and turned it over to Vic Fangio. What do you think he's spending first? And on who? Like who makes the most mm-hmm. sense? As far as an addition to this this defense, I mean, I think they need a middle linebacker. They need a, a three down, you know, downhill player. And you look at some of the players that he's had over the years. I think that's what you you know, whether that was with the Broncos with with Brandon Marshall who took to mm. Chicago, whether that was with um, Roquan with, Smith with Roquan Smith, obviously in Chicago. Um, you know, it's that kind of guy. And I think T.J. Edwards very much sort of fills that fills that mold. I think he obviously needs another safety. Um, to to be able to allow Holland to do what he wants to do because I think he'll play multiple safeties, um, you know. So, um, so yeah, I think you know Jermaine Pratt is another guy. The Bengals would would definitely fit that fit that mold. Um, but Edwards has been a you know one of the best defensive players on a top ten defense for for mm. four straight years. Um, he's a very very good underrated player, and I think um you know three down player. Uh, I think he's an absolutely perfect free agent fit for for a Vic Fangio defense. <laughs> Should Vic Fangio be involved? <laughs> yeah, if Vic Fangio ever decides to to sign, you know, uh, it's uh, Twitter's a mess. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's doing White. sources. <laughs> Kazia White is another guy, another free agent. You know, Philadelphia Eagle, who you could easily see end up with the Dolphins with the work that obviously um, Fangio has done. You know, in Philadelphia this season. Yeah. All right. We'll put Vic Fangio to rest. Hopefully, you know he's locked up here in a, in a couple of in a couple of days, and we could talk about it further later on in the week. But we got to touch on these championship games. We made our predictions uh, before the season. I had forgotten that I made this prediction, but I remember I predicted the Packers and the and the Chiefs, and I expected both quarterbacks to have MVP type years. And Rodgers was absolutely terrible, so I was wrong there. But kind of right on the Chiefs. Uh, what did you make of these games? Let's talk. Let's talk about the Eagles. The Eagles are attempting to go wire to wire. First of all, do you remember a team going wire to wire in the NFL? The um, last one, because I don't. What they do have not to left. Wire? They haven't left the one seed all season. Oh right, okay. And they have not been behind in any game in the postseason. Yeah, no, I can't. Uh... I mean, I should. I, I would assume that the Patriots, in one of their dominating years, two thousand seven, maybe they were. Um, they did that, but no, I can't. You know, it, it look take nothing away from the Eagles. It has been a slightly weaker NFC, and mm. they, you know, we talked about it last week that game against the Giants was tough when you play a team for the third time, and the Giants kind of felt a little bit spent from the the, the big game against the Vikings the week before in the wild card. 
Um, that was a solid win. They, they they showed up, played really well. Yesterday was a difficult game because you know you, you can't really judge. It's not it's not the Eagles' fault that Brock Purdy gets hurt on the second possession, and that game just becomes an utter no mm. contest. You know, um, but I think what it did show was just generally their overall strength. I, I I think it was interesting. You know, their inability for probably two quarters of the game, or you know, quarter and a half, not to be able to move the ball at all on that defense. Um, you know, they really struggled to do so. I, I do think that the the interior defensive linemen for the 49ers were culpable um, a fair amount in terms of A, lacking internal pressure and B, inability to stop the run. But then when you're playing behind that offensive line, I mean, you know, Jordan Mailata five years ago had never even played American football. You know, was a rugby player in, in, mm. in Australia, comes in, he's now, you know, top five left tackle in the NFL. You've got Landon Dickerson absolutely killing people at left guard. Jason Kelsey's a first ballot Hall of Fame center. Um, the the kid at right guard um, you know, is the most unheralded of the of the bunch and is still a really good player. And then at right tackle, you've got a, probably a first ballot Hall of Famer in, in Lane Johnson, the best right tackle in the league over the past decade. Um, you know, and some of the some of the snaps that Jalen Hurts had five six seconds to 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 get rid of the ball. Your first contact on running backs wasn't being made till three four yards down the field. So. Um, I think it'll be a really interesting matchup in the Super Bowl, but it, it's hard to judge the Eagles really because yesterday was such a you know and such a one sided affair. And I do think that you know the NFL has to look at that third quarterback because Jimmy Jimmy Garoppolo could have played, could have thrown the ball. You know, yesterday if they were able to suit up an emergency third quarterback, which I think you know deep down Roger Goodell was at that game. He was sat there with Joe Biden. That's not a spectacle for for America or the world no. when you know you, you you don't have a quarterback that can that can throw the ball. You know. Brock Purdy has to come back in and he said afterwards he said I, I couldn't throw the ball further than five yards I mean that's that's the NFC championship and I know injuries happen but even so yeah even know. in the regular season it just looks it looks odd like uh the game in New England uh when uh Teddy Bridgewater goes down and um Skylar Thompson was complaining about something with his hand and they're on the sideline trying to make sure that Cedric Wilson knows how to take a snap like, that's mm. ridiculous, <laughs> you know? And we saw a game a couple of years ago for COVID, which, in my opinion, that game should have been canceled or postponed or done mm. whatever with. But that was an absolute joke. I think you know which game I'm talking about. The one where the Broncos had to play an entire game with a wide receiver yeah, at, at quarterback. At quarterback, yeah. And it was essentially a free win for, I believe it was the Saints. Yeah. In the was. middle of a playoff race. That's not fair. And the Broncos were a legitimate you know, like 500-ish team that with a decent quarterback had a good chance to win a game at home against the Saints. But no, that's not that's not what happened. The Saints who was got the, a... Um, who was the um, Kendall, Hill, Kendall Hinton, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> who was the um, who was the head coach of that Denver Bronco team? It was Vic Fangio. It was Vic Fangio. <laughs> <laughs> it was Vic Fangio. And I believe that, that Hinton was one for six. Prolific passing day. Yeah, I want to see that completion. Like, uh, how did he get a completion? Like, who did he complete a pass it was to? A little, it was a little screen, I think. Oh, no, it was a thirteen-yard pass to Noah Fant. Nice. But he was great, one great of throw. He was one of nine. Nice. Two picks. One of nine for thirteen yards. No touchdowns. Two picks. You know what? I I always it's the it's one of the greatest hypotheticals. Can a guy off the street play a snap in the NFL? I think I could yeah. play nine snaps at quarterback and do pretty much that. Yeah, in the uh, NFL, I, I might throw two more picks though. I don't think you could, mate. It's like it's like blokes on Twitter saying that they could take a set off Serena Williams. It's like good luck, lads. If you even got a shot over the net against Serena Williams, I'd give you five hundred quid. Let alone win a set. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Kansas City, Cincinnati. This this game had juice. All right, uh, this is fun to watch. This is two good teams going at it. Uh, two great quarterbacks. Burrow didn't play all that well. Mahomes did. Uh, your thoughts on that game? That was that was something else. And all the shit talking after the game was even better. Yeah, I thought it was a um, I thought it was a really good game. I thought I, I thought Joe Burrow played pretty well, apart from that pick. Really, I didn't think. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it is problematic when you know that offensive line for the second year running has come back to bite the Bengals on the on the ass. You know, it's it's hard. Um. You know, and, and Chris Jones and Frank Clark are so dominant. And Jones, you can line him up inside, outside. You know, it's it's hard for, for Max Sharping and Adenergy just to, and Jackson Carmen just to, to be able to take control of that. And, you know, when you're having, when you're forced to either keep a tight end in and or, um, 
you know, a running back. And, and more often than not, it has to be some RGP Ryan because he's a better blocker than Joe Mixon. So that that essentially just means you're running three man routes. Um, you know, that's a problem. And I think they, they've got to get that fixed, the Bengals, if they want to take the next step. I, I think they're a great team. They're well coached. I, I give Zach Taylor a lot of credit, Luana mm-hmm. Rino a lot of credit. Um, and, you know, they're clearly going to win. The window is is wide open for them. But they they need to fix that offensive line because they thought they were fixing it in the offseason. And I don't think they upgraded it that much. I think Lyle Collins struggled. Jonah Williams was pretty poor. Alex Kappa was decent. Karras was okay. But you know, when you're when you're reliant on three backups, um, you know, a left tackle, right tackle, and a guard, that's uh that's a pretty big hill to climb. And I think it yeah, it came back and bit them on the backside. Flip side of that is that, you know. The Chiefs, once again, I think it'll be a fascinating game because I think Andy Reid will just, you know, there'll be lots of sort of trickeration, lots of, you know, give gives Travis Kelsey a chance to get healthy. He's also 3-0 and against the Eagles, his former team. Yeah, he is. Gives those injured players on offense a chance to get healthy. Their offensive line is good enough to hold up. You know, Andrew Wiley committed a few penalties yesterday, needs to get that out of his system. Um, but overall, I think it'll be a fantastic matchup. And you're, you, you're really looking at, you know, probably the best or at least the most um, complete secondary in terms of the number of players and and the, certainly the best matchup of corners in the NFL against, you know, the, the best quarterback, the MVP, the the best quarterback of a generation in, in, um, in, in Patrick Mahomes. So I think it's going to be a great Super Bowl matchup, really interested, really intrigued by what, what's going to happen. Yeah, and in a couple of weeks we'll we'll absolutely talk about it. Yeah, the uh, but I completely agree with you. The, the Bengals they have they have a fabulous that that's a great team, well coached. Uh, especially that defense. Lou Anarumo is is top notch. They have they have talent that's emerging on that side of the ball, but on the offensive side of the ball, they need an offensive line. And and I and I don't like those running backs. Those running backs they're just not good running backs. You know, Joe yeah. Joe Mixon has always been a little bit overrated, and he's very highly paid for what he produces. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's not he's not Christian McCaffrey. Like he's not that big of a difference maker. No. no, so they need to do a remake. Well, if you if you're on OnlyFans, uh Chris Kaufman is posting like um novels on there. And it turns out that Jed York, uh owner of the San Francisco 49ers and Stephen Ross have a blood feud that's been going on for years. And who knows if this is the latest, <laughs> the latest salvo being fired by Jed York. It involves politics, it involves city council meetings it involves it involves stadiums it involves owner votes look it up it's it's out there uh, let me see who wrote it's on the san francisco Chron- uh, chronicle and it's written by mike silver <laughs> okay Put so in. look up that article it's uh it's juicy so maybe the 49ers really are trying to muscle in here at the at the 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 final hour to try to screw over the miami dolphins well if it happens, we'll talk about it. If it doesn't happen, we'll talk about it as well. But that's it. There is no more. We will talk to you later this week. Thanks for listening to Three Yards Per Caddy. You can subscribe via iTunes, on Podbean, or your usual podcast provider. 